Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the first international webinar of this year organized by Vet Scientific Med Advance. Uh, I'm Alba Martos. I'm the international vet of Affinity. And I'm really happy to share with you that today we are with Marta Planellas. Uh, she's a doctor and she's a member of the of Australian and New Zealand Vet College as a feline specialist. And currently she works in the vet hospital of the University of Barcelona as well as the pet hospital uh, called Canis in Tirona. But uh, well, uh, before starting, I would like to remind you that you can write your questions during this session uh, on the YouTube chat, and we will answer all of them at the end of this session. And also keep in mind that at the end of this webinar, you will be able to download the presentation in this uh, YouTube page. And in this sense, you can, uh, you can consult the, the presentation and the webinar when you want. So uh, I think that now we can start. Good afternoon, Marta. Good afternoon. Thank you for um, inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, <coughs> thanks for, for sharing with, uh, with us your knowledge today. And well, I think that in session we will discuss about the pediatric patients and which guidelines we can follow with them. And first of all, Marta, I would like to ask you why do you think that it's so important to talk about pediatric patients and which topics do you think that are the most important ones? Thank you, Alba, for the presentation. I'm very happy to be here and I think that this topic of pediatric patients is important for all beds and also owners. We have to inform our clients how to manage with these uh, patients, and they are quite sensible and susceptible to, to mortality. So we, we will try to um, make um, a point in every of these issues to be clear how we can help them to survive and have a, a better health in this uh, period of life. We will treat on how immunity works at this period, how can we help them with diet or supplements uh, to improve their life and vaccines and their effects and also uh, warming protocols to keep them the most healthy as possible as we can. So uh, let's start with the beginning, Marta. Uh, uh, we know that when we are talking about puppies or kittens, the immune system is really important. So can you explain us how uh, does they acquire this immune system and how we can manage it? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very important to know a little bit about their immunity when they are really young. Uh, when they are born, they only have a basic immunity um, that works with cells. It's a very um, it's the innate immunity and it's very basic. Afterwards, uh, uh, newborns have passive immunity obtained by, by the mothers. Due to the nature of the placenta in dogs, the immunity is not passed by the placenta, so they depend on colostrum intake. That's a very important point in those species because we need that they take colostrum in order to have um, mother antibodies and to be protected, protected during the the, the first week of la weeks of life. Um, it's crucial from neonatal period till weaning um, to protect these animals because they are very, very um, prone to, to have infections. They are susceptible to infections because the immune response is not proper. Uh, he stays with a Th2 response. Uh, from gestation till, till the first weeks of life. And it's not after they are older, further weeks, like two months later, that they increase their immu immunocompetence. So in a neonatal patient, uh, we need to, to give them colostrum because it's in the first 24 hours where immunoglobulins can be absorbed to the bloodstream and then uh, provide um, immunitary protection. After this 24 hours, the intestine, the, the gut, it's closed, so there's no more um, transference. So um, in this moment, from zero to two months, we need to protect these 
patients to avoid infections because they are quite susceptible. So we, we can keep them warm with good hygiene, the, the best diet or milk, or, or if it's possible, natural, mo natural mother milk is the best option to keep them healthy. Afterwards, there's another period from two months to six months where diet is solid. Uh, they start to be more immunocompetent. Uh, their response uh, shifts to Th1, so it's more um, effective against infectious the, uh, or, um, etiology. But also, mother antibodies decline, so we uh, we can act there, vaccinating those patients. So. Uh, immunity can improve uh, if we um, um, give them vaccines at that time. Obviously, passive immunity is crucial in those patients. They protect them for the first weeks with uh, anti maternal antibodies. But there's a phenomenon. Um, after 10 weeks, the un maternal antibodies decline progressively. So there's a, a susceptibility window where there are modern antibodies, but they are not enough to protect the puppy. At that time, vaccines can't work because they are blocked by the mother antibodies. So it's this window of susceptibility that we have to take to account in order to program our scheduled vaccines. Okay. This is what happens. The mother antibody declines, so we need to vaccinate several times Till the puppy is uh, uh, enough mature to um, develop the, his own antibody response. And that's important and where we can act to promote a, a, a permanent uh, immunity for these puppies. So uh, after mother uh, acquired uh, passive immunity, uh, puppy will need a cure, a cure immunity from natural um, uh, contact or uh, via vaccines. When there's no contact, when mother antibodies are not longer in the puppy, when we vaccinate them, we can obtain an immune response in more or less 10 days. But it's not after the second vaccine that we would obtain a, a memory, an immune memory um, to keep them really protect. So we need two contacts from anti agents with the antibodies of the puppy to be uh, protected. So that means without uh, mother antibodies. Okay, that's why we need multiple vaccines at, at the early age in puppies and kittens. Thanks, Marta. So uh, knowing uh, how important colostrum is, um, what happens when a puppy or a kitten uh, does not have taken enough colostrum, uh, which is the best way to improve its immune system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question because sometimes happens maybe because the kittens or puppies are um, funded in the street or maybe the mother dies or whatever, whatever happens that the mother can give them uh, enough colostrum or milk. That's our, um, our um, we need to, to do something to improve their intake. So because natural milk and colostrum can, cannot be supplied by any other artificial um, supplements, it's the best way to guarantee healthy status and survival because they have um, immunoglobulins, immunonutrients that promotes growth factor, um, that gives energy, and that's the best way to protect our puppies with natural milk and colostrum. But if we don't have that, um, that um, um, protection and that source of nutrients, we had to do other actions to promote uh, puppies' health. First of all, uh, if, if it's possible, we should teach the owners to um, assist suckling of colostrum in the first hours uh, of living of the, uh, the um, after birth. So first of all, assist suckling if it's possible to uh, be sure that they receive colostrum and promote um, milk, ingest, milk, milk ingestion afterwards. 
that's the main point. If it's not possible, uh, then afterwards we need to supply, supply maternal milk with uh, commercial supplements. We have to avoid overfeeding, but that's a good point. And if the, this maternal milk is as much similar as canine natural, canine natural milk, it's better for the puppy. Even though there are um, other options to um, assist this colostrum intake, uh, in farm animals, it's very common to use uh, colostrum banks. It's true that in, in canine, because in kitten, there's no studies, but there's not much canine colostrum banks, but can be an option. It's a bit weird how it's obtained, because that means that, uh, that a mother has no puppies and we just suckle in a more hygienic way the colostrum to keep it uh, free for the next puppies. That, May, may need it. That's an option. It's not really commonly used, but it's an option. But other options in dogs that can, can have the colostrum is uh, to supplement them with canine serum or plasma that can be um, administered orally. This does, has been seen that does not increase immunoglobulins in blood but they promote puppies' health, they increase weight and, and gastrointestinal health, so it's quite a good option. It's easy to obtain, easy to administer to puppies because it's oral from birth till one month of age. That's an option. Other option is to supply other sources of colostrum. Uh, it's true that bovine colostrum can be easily found. Fine, that's an option. There's no immunoglobulins a specific, specific for dogs, it's la, uh, but immunoglobulins in the gut, gut, in the intestines, can promote intestinal health and help to have um, beneficial bacteria in the intestine. So bovine colostrum can offer energy, growth factors, and immunoglobulin, immunoglobulins to these puppies. That's an option. Another option is um, that it's like a, a promising, promising tool. It's the hyperimmune egg powder obtained of vaccinated hens against coronavirus or E. coli. Thus, adds a, a good point for these puppies because it's a specific antibodies directed to diseases that affect them and also provides its energy and growth factors that, that have callous, um uh, in this product, so it's a, a good point. Thanks, Marta. I think that now it's quite clear which is the role of colostrum and how we can improve it. So now maybe we can move to the next phase because we know that uh, a key also in puppies and kittens is to uh, move them from milk to the real food. So I don't know if uh, you can explain us how to manage this transition from one phase to the other one. Yeah. Yeah, that this transition is where we can act uh, more uh, with more with a diet. That's a, a good point to to take care. We know that immune system depends on the diet, so it's a great point to take care. Um, and as we as we have told, these dogs uh, are susceptible. They are in the period of life where the immune system is fragile. Also. Geriatric dogs are in this fragile, have this fragile immune system, but uh, puppies and all dogs suffer of that. This immune system is not <clears throat> working properly. It's true that after weaning, puppies are a little bit stronger, but they are submitted to different stresses. Diet, change of diet is one of them. Also, travels, vaccines. Um, uh, so they are um, prone to have problems with the monetary system at that age. Also, if we consider that intestine is the huge immune organ uh, and that it's very common that puppies ha have diarrhea due to changes on diet, due to stress, we have to really take care of this moment of transition from liquid to solid uh, diet. How can we help these puppies to, to have a, a smooth transition. The, the logical terms to, to assure a, 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 an ideal diet for these puppies is to supply components that are quite similar to the milk, <clears throat> to modern milk. 
in order to make this a, sl a smooth transition. How we should, uh, should um, add products that are present in milk, like nucleotides, fatty acids, uh, immunoglobulins, that would be um, really uh, good for these puppies. Also, what we want is to reduce the risk of diarrhea. So adding probiotics or prebiotics can help to reduce the risk of diarrhea. Also having immunoglobulins in the diet will help on that. And obviously to stimulate and boost the immune system in those puppies that are uh, a little bit, that are susceptible. So that can be achieved also by nucleotides, calostrum, or hyperimmune egg powder. <clears throat> According to studies, uh, there's, it's known that diets can um, act in the immune system in different levels. The basic level of diet and immune system, it's supplying the basic nutrients in order to have a normal development of the immune system. That's the basic level of action of a diet uh, to the immune response. No? We, if we um, give uh, the correct amount of protein, vitamins, um, fatty acids, the, the puppy and the kitten would be able to develop his or her immune, uh, immune system. The second level of action of a diet would be uh, stimulate this immune system. This is achieved uh, using prebiotics to promote uh, beneficial bac bacteria in the gut, uh, using nucleotides, glut glutamine, and other antioxidants to uh, stimulate this immune system in a general way. And the third level is to um, Im immunomodulate more, more straight to, to generate um, a good protection using probiotics, calostrum or hyperimmune egg with immunoglobulins to protect intestinal gut and also to promote uh, this immune, uh, immune system. So this, those levels are very important uh, of how, how diets can, uh, can uh, help this immune system. So we would like to give these puppies and kitten a diet that have fatty acids to promote uh, growth, growth and to give essential basic nutrients for the immune system. Nucleotides that has been a very important promoter <clears throat> of cells and immune system. Prebiotics to keep healthy in the, in the guts. Probiotics and immunoglobulins. So that's what we are looking for in a diet uh, as a starter. It's true that uh, small dogs and big dogs have different necessities in the diet. Um, large breed um, grows very, very fast. We don't want that they are fat when they are uh, puppies because they can have afterward, uh, later on, problems on their joints. So we don't want overfeeding those patients. And we will um, have a levels of calcium and phosphor adequate for those breeds. We don't need to add supplements of calcium and phosphor if we give a balanced diet because we can stabilize this, this uh, studied diet for them. So uh, we have to, to be concerned of this um, puppy starting diet. Thanks, Marta. I think that now we, we have more information about how to manage diet in this kind of animals. Uh, but now I would like to ask you about the vaccines that we know that it's, it's really important in, in puppies and kittens. So I would like if, if we can remind which kind of vaccines do we have nowadays in the market and, and how they work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we have mainly two types of vaccines. We have infectious vaccines and non-infectious vaccines. Uh, we consider infectious vaccines those that are um, mainly modified like vaccines or recombinants or vector uh, that use vector vectors. Uh, and this kind of infectious vaccines um, can promote the disease. Uh, antigen can replicate and um, can promote the disease mildly. Uh, but this, the good thing is that the immune system is very nicely stimulated when those can be protective. 
And uh, it's true that there's a, a slight risk of clinical signs, but we just uh, put the vaccine in a, in, a, in a method that it's not the, the infection route usually, usually. So we use it quite commonly. It's a good vaccine to promote uh, immuno, immunoprotection. The other kind of vaccine are non-infection uh, vaccines. They are killed or inactivated, and they can add an adjuvant to, to promote their action. Because the antigen does not uh, generate clinical signs, is not that strong in uh, stimulating uh, antibody response. So usually they need adjuvant, and multiple doses are required to be, uh, to be more uh, immunostimulant. Okay? Um, so we have those both kinds of vaccines, infections and non-infections vaccines, that we can check in the levels of, of the vaccines we are used to, to administrate to check which kind of vaccine we are dealing with. Also, we can divide vaccines according, um, apart from the, the, if they are infectious or not infectious, we can classificate them according if they are essential or core, or non-essential non, non or optional or non-core. So uh, how we consider a vaccine core or non-core depends on the uh, severity of the disease they are designed for, the transmissibility of the disease, and if they are zoonotic, they have zoonotic potential or not. They are vaccines that are not recommended because they are, they are not supported of scientific evidence, like a vaccine of coronavirus in, in, in cats or the immunodeficiency in cats also. Okay, then, uh, well, now we have a general overview about which kind of vaccines we have. So let's focus on dogs. Which uh, vaccination protocol do you recommend for dogs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have different guidelines available that you can check if there's any doubt of that. Um, but uh, we have this division of vaccines in core and non-core. In dogs, we consider core vaccines, the ones that are essential in any animals, independently of the way of living and the, where they live. We consider core vaccines, vaccines that include canine parvovirosis, distemper, and um, canine hepatitis, infectious hepatitis. That, those three vaccines are core in dogs, and that's why uh, this kind of vaccines must be applied in all, in all dogs, independently of their life. In some countries, Leptospira is considered also core vaccine due to the, his um, zoonotic potential and because it's quite difficult to avoid the contact of every dog. So, Leptospira can be considered core according to the, the risks uh, the dogs suffer in each country. As non-core vaccines, we have other vaccines. Rabies, usually, also it's a core vaccine the core, according to the legal, legacy of each country. But obviously, in endemic countries, it's core. And in non-endemic countries, it's very highly recommended. It, maybe it's compulsory by law, so according to laws, maybe a core vaccine. Uh, Non-core vaccine typically are those that are um, uh, recommended depending on the life of the dog. If the dog lives uh, with a, a lot of other dogs, it's recommended to vaccine against parainfluenza uh, bardotella, um, bordetella vaccine, for example. Um, there are other vaccines that can be suggested again, uh, according to the life of the dog, but they are not essential. Uh, Borrelia, Babesia, Leishmania, Parainfluenza are the typical uh, non-core vaccines. So, to start with core vaccines in dog, mainly the parvovirus, distemper, and canine hepatitis. Uh, this trivalent is the main vaccine in dogs. It's uh, an infectious vaccine. Uh, with a strong immune response. And it's true that each time appear new variants of parvovirus, we have to take it in a, into account when we choose the vaccine uh, for each dog, but um, uh, we vaccine basically of these three um, agents. Uh, it's true that after the first vaccine, 
with full action of, of I mean, with full um, activation of puppies antibodies, the dog can have his first their first contact with the outside after seven days of the vaccine. We don't know if modern antibodies have blocked the vaccine, so that's the problem. Usually we wait till the second vaccine to, to be outdoors and, and, and in order to be more protected. What we used to do is starting vaccination from seven to eight days, eight weeks um, old. In puppies, six to six from, from six to eight weeks old, we start vaccine. And we revaccine every three to four weeks till the puppy is older than 16 weeks. We do that in order to avoid maternal antibodies and to promote puppy's own uh, immune response. After this last vaccine, uh, after 16 weeks, we revaccinate at, uh, from six to 12 months. Why we do that? Because sometimes if the first vaccination is not properly performed, in some cases, to vaccine at six months, it's, it's a good idea in order to be sure that this puppy uh, have uh, enough antibodies. But usually, if we perform a nice primary vaccination till 16 weeks, we can revaccinate in a year. Afterwards, vaccination, it's not annually. We can perform it every two or three years when the dog is an adult. Leptospira, even in some countries, is considered core, um, others not, but we support this vaccine uh, when they are puppies, but we only need to vaccinate it twice. We can start at eight weeks and then repeat it three to four weeks later. Uh, vaccine of Leptospira adds different variants according to the vaccine you use. Uh, in Spain, for example, we have those variants included in the vaccine. But new reports have suggested new variants. For example, in Spain, the same will happen in other countries. So this vaccine must be on evolution and constant evolution in order to add new variants and protect our puppies to the, uh, from this disease. Rabies, as we said, is a zoonosis. So we have to vaccinate uh, dogs and cats in order to low the, the law in, in each country. We have to follow legalism. And um, you can have killed uh, vaccine with adjuvant or recombinant form of vaccine. And we start vaccination before, um, after 12 or 16 weeks of age. So we, that's the first vaccine um, after, uh, on 16 weeks of the puppy. And we can put it annually or every two or three years according on, on the country the puppy lives. If the dog travels, the vaccine must be applied annually. One non-core vaccine is the uh, vaccine that protects against infectious tracheobronchitis. This vaccine is quite uh, useful in dogs that live in uh, shelters or they are working dogs that they are with plant together with other dogs because this, infectious, uh, this disease is quite infectious and contagious, so um, it's good to, to have them protect. Also, some shelters or, or um, residency homes uh, uh, makes, it, makes it compulsory to have dogs vaccinated in order to control this disease that can be really spread um, between dogs. How we vaccinate against infectious tracheobronchitis in, in puppies? We start at eight months, we repeat it in three to four weeks, and afterwards annually. It's uh, similar to Leptospira. Other non-core vaccines, uh, for example, we have a uh, vaccine against Leishmania. Uh, it's a vaccine that must be applied in dogs that are seronegative, so we have to check antibodies before using this vaccine. And the concept of this vaccine, it's not to obtain a whole protection against Leishmania, but to improve the immune response if the puppy or the dog uh, finally develops this disease. So vaccination against Leishmania does not guarantee uh, that the dog won't be infected, 
but would promote a better immune response. We have two different vaccines in the market. Um, and there are different schedules of vaccination according to the, the vaccine you use. But after the first vaccine, it's annually. And, uh, and it's important to remind that in order to avoid Asmania, repellents, it's the, the, a good point to add uh, to the vaccination schedule. Thanks, Marta. Uh, I think that it's really interesting to understand the vaccination protocol that we have to follow with dogs. I would like to do the same exercise by uh, but for cats. So uh, mm -hmm. can you share with us the same what we can follow uh, for the vaccinations for cats? Okay. Yeah. Also for cats, we have different guidelines that you can check to to have have more details in order the different types of life of cats. So um, I leave these articles there. But yes, in cats happens the same. We have core vaccines and non-core vaccines. Uh, all cats should be vaccinated against core, vac core agents included in core vaccines like feline herpes virus, feline calisovirus, and feline paleocopenia. Those are the core vaccines in, cat in cats. Uh, as non-core vaccines, <clears throat> we have feline leukemia, uh, rabies, and vaccines against bordetella and chlamydia. When we talk of vaccine core vaccines, mainly uh, against respiratory virus like Calaisa virus or herpes virus, um, we know that those vaccines are infectious vaccines. And against these two agents, we have um, uh, a, a protection, but it's not a, a very, very good protection. In those days that cats are uh, vaccinated, uh, have shown that even cats are vaccinated against this respiratory virus, the disease has not decreased on the society. That means that this vaccine helps in controlling and reducing the risks of this um, respiratory uh, virus disease but does not eliminate uh, the disease uh, in the areas. No? So, I mean, you, you can achieve a control, you can reduce clinical signs, but probably the cat can uh, have, can um, suffer a little bit of this disease. On the other hand, the vaccine that it's combined is, that you can obtain a combined vaccine, including pelincalesi virus, herpes virus, and paleocopenia together as a trivalent. Um, on the opposite uh, hand, as we saw with respiratory vi virus, the paleocopenia virus vaccine, it's, it's also an infectious vaccine, but it's very, very good and in promoting, promoting immunity against this disease. So it's very useful to avoid cats having uh, paleocopenia very, very important in shelters where this disease can be devastating. So uh, this is a good and, a, and very important vaccine <clears throat> to protect cats. Uh, in core vaccines, including this uh, vaccine against this three virus, we start the scheduling kittens from six to eight weeks of age. We start vaccinating there then. And then every three and four weeks, we repeat vaccine till the cat has 16 weeks. That means that a cat can, um, can be vaccinated maybe three or four times <clears throat> because we will finish when the, dog, the cat is older than 16 weeks. That's like the dog. Afterwards, we can revaccinate in a year. We have this option of six months if we don't know if the first schedule of vaccine is not correctly performed. If not, we can revaccinate in a year. And afterwards, vaccines are not that um, common in cats. We use it every two or three years if the cat is in a non-risk environment. If the cat lives in a, in a very risk environment where there are plenty of cats, for example, shelters, vaccination can be uh, repeated every year. 
Um, other vaccines like non-core vaccines uh, are um, administered according to the risk of the cat. If there's a really, really high, high risk of chlamydia because they are um, sheltered, maybe has suffered this disease before, then we recommend vaccine also with bordetella, but um, only if the risk is high and this vaccine can, these both vaccines uh, can be administered annually. Talking about leukemia in some areas can be considered a, a core vaccine, but this uh, vaccine is administered uh, to cats that will have an outdoor life or maybe they will live with a cat positive to leukemia. If a cat is always indoors and they live alone, it's not actually necessary. But if there's no, it's no clear how will be the life of the cat, and we don't know if, if the cat will be a little bit out, outdoors in gardens or small areas where maybe a cat can also share the space, it's important to recommend the vaccination. In order to vaccinate those cats, we have to know if they are positive previously to leukemia. It's also good to know if immunodeficiency is there. That's why we have to perform a test. We can perform a test when the cat had been in home in a controlled environment in order to obtain a true result. I mean, if the cat is um, during one month controlled, if um, the test is negative, we will trust, trust in this negative. If not, we don't know if it's a latent infection, maybe on lymph nodes, and after a week, this um, uh, antigen will appear on blood. So we can have or two tests separate uh, in a two-month period, or we can keep the cat control and perform the test uh, after the cat is one month control. When we have a negative result, we can apply vaccine. We, we apply two vaccines in when they are puppies from when they are eight weeks old and after three to, to four weeks. Afterwards, we apply an annual vaccination because uh, cats are very prone to have this disease when they are very young. Afterwards, when they are older, like four or five years, the susceptibility to be infected by leukemia is, is each time lower. But at first years of age, it's really important to vaccinate every year. We try to avoid adjuvant vaccines. We will see in the adverse effects um, that it's not um, adequate to vaccinate with adjuvant. We have other options now, so you can choose. And, um, and this will be for the cats, the schedule for cats. Thank you, Marta. I think that it's uh, clear that the vaccines plays a, a, a really important role for puppies and kittens. But we know that when we are using vaccine, sometimes we have some adverse reactions. Uh, so uh, can you explain us which are the most common ones in puppies and kittens and what we can do to prevent them, to, to avoid this kind of, of adverse reactions? Yeah, thank you, Alba. Yeah, first of all, to say that it's true that adverse effects exist, but never they are that important to uh, decide non vaccine not vaccinating the our pet it's a, as there are many studies about that and always the percentage of adverse reactions are really really low versus the animals vaccinated and the beneficial effects of being vaccinated so taking this into account we can talk about adverse reactions that it's a thing that Beds are very afraid and owners too, and we need to explain a little bit without scaring of the risks uh, of vaccinating. We have different adverse effects. We have um, slight effects like fever, a little bit of malaise, that they are not feeling well. Other reactions like anaphylactic reactions, immune-mediated res immune response, um, tumor induction, and other rare effects of vaccine. Um, first of all, what we usually see is a mild transient fever that it's um, due to this uh, pro-inflammatory 
uh, cytokines that are induced with vaccine. So that's like a normal reaction of vaccine. This, this problem usually lasts one or two days and it's like a slight fever that puppies recover easily and you don't have to do anything about it. Uh, other effects can be like an acute response. Usually what we can see is like angioedema or uh, edema of respiratory areas like glottis. And that's more serious. We had to, to react quickly with this uh, diseases. When, when there's a skin inflammatory response, it's not that uh, severe, but when there's facial or uh, tongue or glottic swollen um, inflammation, it's, it's important. Um, other reactions that we can observe are immune related. We can have like um, uh, immune mediated reactions like anemia or thrombocytopenia, also even polyarthritis. So if we have uh, an animal, a uh, uh, dog usually is more common than cats, but cat or dog with hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, or a, a joint pain, we have to take in our differential that maybe vaccination can be a possible etiology of this uh, effect, these signs. So if this dog had been vaccinated in less than a, than a month, vaccine can be added in a possible etiology of these signs. Uh, other thing that worries us in cats, for example, is the induction of sarcoma associated to vaccine. This was very alarming some years ago. Now we just put methods to avoid it. And also we know that it's not only induced by vaccine, any injection or chronic or, or continuous injection in cats can develop a sarcoma because inflammation of, of tissues can perform a change on fibroblast from inflammatory to tumoral. That, that can happen even with a microchip or long-lasting long antibiotics or other treatments that are applied subcutaneously. So we have to take uh, uh, to be aware of any injection that can promote this sarcoma. It's true that adjuvant vaccines were associated with sarcoma more often. So feline uh, leukemia vaccines and rabies were the most common vaccines associated with induction sarcoma in cats. It's really a, a tough disease and important. We have to apply this rule of one, uh, three to one. If there's an, an, a nodule or mass that persists during three months, you have, we have to be alert that maybe it can be a sarcoma. If it's more than two centimeters of, of size, it's also uh, important. And if the growth has increased in a month, uh, we have to, to suspect of this, this possible tumor. And um, because it's a very, a tumor that can reappear very easily, we don't want to make an excisional biopsy. We need to make a small biopsy to be sure it's a sarcoma. And afterwards, we will need ima image techniques to, to be sure the, uh, the um, spread of the tumor and to uh, apply the, the, um, the best uh, surgical resection possible. The resection is very aggressive. We need uh, five centimeter margins and we need to take off uh, two fascial planes. So um, we need really a, a huge surgery to get rid of this tumor and to be curative. If not, um, if we don't take it out completely, it won't be cured and we will need um, other therapies to, to, be, to beat this uh, tumor. So when we vaccinate um, a cat, we have to, to think about the beneficial point of being vaccinated and, um, and the risks. And uh, we will try to avoid adjuvant vaccines. And it's important to vaccinate subcutaneously in order to uh, detect possible nodules easily than if the vaccine is applied intramuscularly that it would be deeper and difficult to detect possible nodules. Um, it's true that cats, now that we are more aware of the risk of having sarcoma, we have a channel in order to vaccinate cats in places where, in case of sarcoma appearance, 
we can make a, a wide surgery um, assuring curative effects like in the legs. So we try to avoid interscapular area. Sometimes it's not possible because the, do the cat is not very collaborative and you have to vaccinate them. But if it's possible, we will try to vaccinate on the legs. On the right uh, front leg, we use trivalent. On the rear legs, left for le leukemia, right for rabies. This uh, aid us to detect nodules and to associate these possible sarcomas to vaccine administration. Okay. Um, other rare effect, uh, adverse effects of vaccines are, for example, this hypertrophic osteodystrophy described in, in Weimar runners, and also interstitial nephritis associated with vaccines in cats. Um, there is a paper that associates vaccination and dental uh, disease uh, to risk factor uh, of chronic kidney disease in cats. That's interesting because maybe this uh, stimulation of antibodies can uh, um, induce renal disease in cats. That's an interesting point. So we will minimize the vaccines. And also uh, another possibility that this uh, interstitial nephritis can appear in cats it's because uh, some vaccines use uh, um, renal cell, cellular um, cultures, and maybe this uh, presence of these cells can promote nephritis. Um, this is, it's not that common, but it's interesting to take it to be aware of that. Thanks, Marta, for this clear explanation. Uh, Last question uh, we have, it's about parasites that they are affecting uh, dogs and cats. So maybe we can finish this session talking about these parasites, which are the most important ones and how can they affect uh, our puppies and kittens? Okay. Yeah, this is an important part also to take care of our puppies because being parasite, I mean, um, if the puppy has parasites, they can have a less potent response to vaccine and their immune status can be affected. So if we want to have healthy puppies and kittens, we need to deworm them. We can uh, have different kinds of, of parasites. We can have cardiorespiratory parasites like Angiostrongylus basorum in dogs. Dogs that eat snails are prone to have this uh, parasite, and cats that hunt or eat lizards, rabi, I, mice, uh, or birds can have Ilostrongylus abstrusus. In, ca in the case of cats with Ilostrongylus abstrusus, it's a quite common parasitosis of the pulmonary area, and it's a great differential of cough in a young cat. Uh, other parasites, uh, gastrointestinal parasites, are present in puppies. There are a huge amount of different kind of parasites that can appear um, in puppies, like rhombed worms, tape worms, or, or protozoas. So a nice point is to perform uh, comprologic analysis um, in order to define which parasite our puppy has because the treatment is a little bit different according to the parasite present in puppies. It's true that nearly all puppies are infected uh, with parasites that can be transmitted via placenta or milk. Um, if mothers are not properly deworm during pregnancy, it's quite common that puppies are infected. So the worming schedule it started very early. We start when the puppies are 15 days old or three weeks old, more or less. And we repeat it in 15 days. And afterwards, we deworm them every month till they are six months old. Afterward, we can deworm um, in a schedule of every three to four months. But when they are puppies till the six months, it's important to deworm them every month. Also, puppies live very close to us, and that's a risk for our health because there are zoonoses. We can share parasites because we are really in touch with them. So it's very important to, to have them deworm. 
there are, there are parasites that are as well, that have an important genetic potential. So be sure of uh, a proper the warming schedule is important, and also um, analysis of phases in order to know with what we are dealing. It's important also to keep these kittens and puppies free from external parasites because there are uh, worms that are that come from fleas, for example, dipilidium. So we want to get rid uh, from external and internal parasites. Uh, when mentioned to this disease, Trichicomonas in cat, it's important because sometimes we don't think on this disease and, and it's like uh, driving us mad why young cats uh, can have uh, uh, intestinal, large intestinal diarrhea in a chronic way. That, and you, usually we perform normal tests and they are all normal, no worms, no abnormalities on fecal culture, no one reminds this on an eye, um, blood test, and it's like what's happening with this cat that do not respond to diet and, and everything. We have to, to be aware that young dogs, usually pure breeds that came from breeders, can have uh, this liquid mucous diarrhea in a chronic, in a, with chronic signs. It's so inflammatory in the final part of the intestine, even we can see. Uh, rectal prolapse, and we have to think in the presence of three trichomonas. The issue is that this protozoa must be diagnosed using PCR, so we need to send a fecal sample to look for that uh, protozoa. It's true that the bad thing is that it's like a chronic disease, quite annoying for, for the owner and the cat, but the good thing is that it used to be self-limiting, and in a year or two, probably the cat will stop having these problems. But how can we help those cats? Obviously, we can use a, um, a multifactorial treatment using probiotics in order to restore flora, prebiotics with fiber, soluble, sol soluble fiber, fiber like psyllium, in order to the, reduce inflammation in the, the large part of the intestine. And we can support them with metronidazole, metronidazole, that's an option. But the, the drug that acts directly against trichicomona is ronidazole. Ronidazole it's, uh, can be toxic, uh, brain, can have brain toxicity. We should add, um, alert owners of that. But used carefully, it's an option. So those cats can be managed with diet, fever, and probiotics. Um, in a, in a long way in order to protect this intestine and to promote uh, rehabilitation, okay? That's an important disease to take into account in cats too. So with this, we finish the main points to take care of our puppies and kitten. So thank you for, your, uh, for the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Marta, for your explanation. I think that now it's uh, time to move to, to our questions. I think that we have several ones in our chat, so let, let's connect to our questions. Thank you. Happy to answer. Hi, Marta. Hi. So, so let's, I, I think that now we can move to the first question that we have received during our session. The first one, uh, it's uh, about how many kilocalories does a puppy or kitten need, need when we fed them with milk supplements? Can you help us with, with this question? Yeah, usually this is difficult because uh, the main thing is to follow the brand, what, what the brand suggests you about kilocalories. But sometimes if you have to count how many kilocalories they need, you, you can use the formula of rest energy requirements. And puppies used to need uh, like three times the rest energy requirements um, used by the formula. So you can calculate the kilocalories. And uh, when they are older, the, um, 
I mean, from zero to four months, they need three times their rest energy requirements. We can calculate that with a formula that we can find everywhere with the weight of the puppy, and this can aid us. Okay, many thanks, Marta. The second question is uh, about what additional vaccines we can give to the cats that are li uh, living indoors, but they are living with the dog. Usually when cats live indoors, they don't need that much vaccines, even if they live with dogs. They use not to share disease except of um, Bordetella bronchiseptica and also Leptospira. So those uh, diseases can be considered, but if the dog doesn't have, um, I mean, if in the house there's not a big amount of animals, it's not really necessary to vaccinate the cat with Bordetella bronchiseptica, neither Leptospira. So I would follow the usual vaccines as we, as we perform in a normal cat. Okay, I think that it's, it's clear now. And the last question we have, it's about if it's possible that vaccination causes steroid responsive meningitis and arteritis for dogs. Because, uh, well, we have a, a, st a steroid response. Again? Yes, the, the last question is that if it's possible that vaccination in dogs can cause steroid responsive meningitis and arteritis because, uh, well, there is one attendee that says that some clients, uh, they treat the dogs and then it seems that when they vaccine the dogs, this, uh, this uh, problem comes again. So maybe mm -hmm. it has some relationship with uh, the vaccination. It's true that vaccination can uh, um, make like a, a starting disease, immunomediated disease. It can be the, the starting point. And we, we have seen uh, polyarthritis re related with uh, vaccines. So if an animal suffers of a disease that it's immune mediated, it can be um, worsened with if vaccine is uh, added to the treatment uh, as, as an annual treatment. So those animals should be um, notified by a vet that maybe they, they have not to be vaccinated if they are ill. And if the animal is not ill, the disease can appear, this, this steroid meningitis or polyarthritis, because there are description of uh, immunomediated diseases associated to vaccine. Usually they are, they are not that severe of an, an, a primary immunomediated polyarthritis, for example, but they can appear. So, so if a dog had been vaccinated or a cat, Usually that appears more in dogs than cats. One month before before these signs appears, it can be considered that vaccine can can be a possible etiologic um, uh, agent. But yeah, when we are dealing with animals that have these kinds of diseases, it's very difficult to decide if they need to be vaccinated or not. The risks had to be considered, but if they do a normal life with no many risks, Usually, vaccine is not uh, advised. Okay, many thanks, Marta. I think that uh, well, it has been really helpful for all of us. And uh, now we are at the at the end of this webinar. Uh, I I thanks all the attendees that we have uh, here today, and I encourage you to follow us our well in our Beds and Clinics um, YouTube channel because we will have more webinars in the future. And well, as I said, I hope you have enjoyed this session, and I hope to see you come back. Thanks very much. <laughs>